So I'll just I'll start. Uh, thank you guys for uh, for coming. Uh, my name is Jislan Bisengadaga. Uh, originally from uh, Burkina Faso, uh, West Africa, but I reside in New Jersey, United States, and I'm one of the lead developer on the Smart OS uh, project, which is a distribution based on FreeBSD. Um, and today I'm going to be presenting um, one of the major work that we had to do in the source street to actually uh, achieve a specific um, uh, action that we wanted to uh, to achieve for the partner that we are currently collaborating with. Again, uh, thank you for coming. Your presence here shows interest and I hope that this session will be informative enough to, uh, to please your curiosity. Uh, but before we get into any more detail, I wanna take the time to uh, present what's gonna be presented here or summarize what's gonna be presented here and in what order. So let's move to the table of content. Uh, so this session starts by uh, elaborating on the reason why uh, one may wanna improve the boot procedure or the boot uh, display in particular. Then a quick overview of the boot procedure is given uh, that will serve as a, a, an introduction or that will help us introduce the main topic, which pertains to the bootloader and the different features that he, he has, or the ones that we are currently working on. And the discussion on the bootloader would actually force us to discuss a little bit about uh, boot two or stage zero or the MBR, depending on uh, the terms we want to use. Then uh, stage one, um, or boot one, stage two, or boot two, which are the very next stages in the boot procedure. Then we'll uh, cover a bit of history uh, about BTX client. That will give us the historical aspect, uh, the historical context that we need to actually understand uh, the power behind the bootloader and the different features that he has. And the last part will be devoted to um, illustrating the different benefits and the application of the theming system that we actually implemented. Um, and then a short demonstration will be uh, given to put everything together. And uh, hopefully afterwards, I'll, I hope uh, I'll have enough time for any questions if you have, uh, if you guys have any already. So why would you, uh, why would one, uh, let's say an entity wanna improve on the boot procedure? Uh, generally speaking, it's always good to uh, know how things start uh, as we human are mostly interested in genesis of things, beginning of life. Uh, we engineers, for us engineers, uh, the boot procedure is quite important. So that, would, that may be a reason. But uh, in our particular case, uh, we needed an, an easy way to colorize and uh, display brands and logos in a way to represent environments. So we actually started uh, working on, on uh, making that happen. Uh, so why would you want to do that uh, if the FreeBSD actually has a, already has, uh, let's say a source code. Um, yes, the FreeBSD has source code that actually does that, but uh, it's a bit limited because um, depending on what you, you, you want to do, uh, there's mechanical work involved. Uh, you may have to set specific um, strings to have a specific uh, result. Uh, but with the framework that we, we worked on, uh, all of this is uh, automated. So these may be one of the reasons why uh, one may want to uh, go through uh, implementing a, a change on the bootloader. Um, actually, when uh, a bit fast, I actually wanted to uh, elaborate on the different points of the uh, terminal capabilities before we move on. So the presentation uh, is mostly concerned about the concept of theming system. Um, and um, because of that, we'll have to touch on some of the aspect there as I, 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 I mentioned. And uh, uh, probably, okay. Okay, let's touch. Alrighty, so again, the reason we're already given. Um, now we'll move on to the quick overview that will uh, 
serve as an introduction, a uh, good introduction to discuss the remaining um, food blocks. So we may all be aware that uh, as soon as we power on our machine, it goes through a post procedure, uh, power on self test. Then if, when that uh, succeeds, the BIOS kicks in or the uh, basic input output system. And then um, it goes looking for the MBR, which contains the partition table and then reads that and passes control to uh, boot zero, which is the, uh, the, the boot manager. And from then, uh, the machine is get set by uh, a few uh, rudimentary instructions and then control is passed to uh, boot one, which does the same. And then control is passed to boot two, which is a boot client. I mean, a uh, uh, BTX client. I'll try to clarify on the term there because um, it's a bit confusing sometimes. Uh, so from boot two, we actually go to the bootloader again, which uh, this presentation uh, uh, is focused on. Alrighty, so what exactly happened uh, at stage zero? So stage zero, uh, boot zero or the MBR, uh, the master boot record, again, depending on uh, the term that you want to use, uh, is actually the first code that um, gains control from the BIOS. And um, it, it, has, um, it is located on the first sector on the first track, contains both code and uh, data. The data contained is represented uh, by the uh, partition table and the code is represented by the instruction that uh, gets run to pass control to the next boot block. Uh, it's important to mention that uh, for this presentation, uh, we kept things simple. So we didn't really uh, add um, uh, details about other uh, partition specification like GPT. And also it's important to note that uh, it's also possible to uh, boot the system from different medias like CD-ROM, but uh, to keep things simple, we'll just focus on uh, like a standard uh, installation. Alrighty, so as I was saying, boot two um, is the first piece of code that uh, gets uh, uh, control from the BIOS. And once it's done doing its work, it goes looking for the next boot black, which is boot one. Boot one is very similar to uh, boot zero in some sense. Uh, they have, they both have a size limitation of uh, 512 bytes. Depending on the literature, uh, that uh, number may change. But um, boot one has very rudimentary uh, code as well. And it gains control from uh, the boot manager, as I said. And once again, it's important to note that uh, at that point, it's also possible to install different boot managers like uh, Grab or Refine, depending on uh, what you're most familiar with. But we'll, again, keep things simple. Um, and then uh, just focus on the most basic installation. Alrighty, so stopping the boot procedure when uh, boot zero is running, uh, you get this prompt. We'll see that in the demonstration that uh, I'll be uh, I'll be providing uh, to make it a little bit clear. And again, this may all be familiar to you guys, so I uh, will not uh, take too much time. Um, and then um, stage one, which is uh, the next boot uh, block after the MBR or the uh, boot manager is again, as I was saying, similar to uh, boot zero. It really has rudimentary code to uh, set up a few important uh, memory addresses, a few important register addresses and a few IO ports. Um, and once that's done, the machine uh, is at a specific state and you know control is passed to the uh the the next boot black which is boot two now from boot one to boot two um once boot two gets loaded uh in memory it needs its environment be set up in a specific way um and the reason is because it's a boot two is actually a btx client um, the presentation will try to make the term a bit clearer, um, but uh, because of that fact, boot two has a lot more room uh, to store a more elaborate code, more sophisticated code. Um, so the size limitation that the previous boot blocks uh, knew is lifted at this stage. And one of the advantages 
at this stage is that uh, the sophistication of the code allows the next block, which is the loader, to be also uh, more sophisticated because uh, the BTX client actually provides uh, the necessary services for the next boot block. So um, at this stage, um, what we have done so far is really um, limited IO uh, operations, uh, set a few uh, registers, um, setting a few memory addresses and registers uh, addresses. Uh, but so far we haven't uh, reached uh, the 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 uh, operating system yet. Uh, but as I was saying, Boot Two is a uh, is a BTX client. Uh, we'll have to uh, elaborate on that, as I was saying, to make the uh, term a bit clear. But once you uh, stop the boot procedure uh, at the right time when um, uh, Boot Two is actually uh, running, this is the prompt that you see. Uh, it may be different depending on uh, the machine that you have, but um, we'll go over a a, a demonstration to uh, actually make that clear as well. Alrighty, so Boot Two, uh, being a BTX client. Uh, brings a few advantages and to uh, actually have a full grasp of those advantages, we'll have to travel back in history and to get a, uh, a full historical context. So what exactly are BTX clients? Uh, until now, we really did not touch on the subject because it's a bit complex. Um, at times um, I get confused myself, but um, the way I actually understand is uh, BTX clients are necessarily implementation at the ABI level, uh, which allow the, 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 the hardware to uh, access, uh, to actually, let's say, um, uh, implement basic virtual memory uh, management. So that's one of the advantages of implementing uh, BTX clients. So going back into history, so how do we happen uh, to uh, implement the text client? So what happened um, initially was that uh, approximately around the release of the 8088 computer, um, processors back then were, uh, computers in general back then were made following a specific ABI architecture uh, that required that uh, registers be 16 bits and um, memory addresses 20 bits. Um, that architecture quickly uh, became a problem um, because uh, the interesting problem that actually came up was the uh, the ability to store a 20 bit address into a 16 bit address. So, you know, depending on uh, your skills, this may be a challenge. And um, to solve the problem, uh, a new uh, scheme was devised called uh, real real mode access memory real mode access. Um, and uh, in this scheme, uh, two 16-bit registers uh, were actually used. Uh, one used as a base register and the second used as a, uh, a uh, offset or position. And then whenever you needed to actually uh, store the 20-bit address, uh, the register would be shifted four times and then the memory address uh, a start in it. So this is the trick that uh, engineers uh, came about to alleviate the problem. Uh, and with that nifty trick, uh, they were able to actually access about uh, one megabyte of memory, uh, but still the real access mode uh, still had limitations. Today, uh, one meg would not even be enough to store this document. So. Again, engineers went to work and then uh, devised another, uh, another, another scheme uh, called protected mode uh, in, and where the two registers uh, that, that were involved in the real mode were actually used to store and uh, uh, retrieve data. And in doing so, uh, engineers were now able to access a lot more uh, memory addresses. So up to four gig of memory. So again, um, what are the advantages of going about this, uh, devising all of these schemes? First of all, it made it a bit easier for implementers, uh, assembly language programmers. Uh, 
Uh, as I was saying, the problem that came about storing 20 bits address into a 16 bit was a bit alleviated because now you had a uh, more flexibility, I would say, with the two addresses that you could use to uh, uh, store and retrieve data. And uh, that would be the, the, the first advantage. Um, but here, the difference is that those two registers, uh, those two 16 bit registers that were used, uh, had to be accessed in a protected mode, uh, protected fashion. And uh, using this technique, again, engineers were able to uh, uh, access more uh, memory and it made uh, the life, if I can say it, it made life easier for engineers as well. On top of uh, giving us the ability to have loaders that are a lot more sophisticated. Um, so with this bit of uh, history covered, uh, which now gives us the historical context that we need to focus on the bootloader, uh, we'll now uh, discuss the bootloader and its feature in more, in more detail. Uh, but it's important to uh, note that the boot procedure has been divided in three main stages. Uh, but if you count, um, if you want to count properly, uh, stage zero is stage zero, but stage one and two are actually combined. Uh, and the reason is again, is because of the size limitation. Uh, it had to be broken down into di two different blocks. So that's uh, an important an important point to keep in mind because of the uh, next stage that's coming, which is uh, stage three or the bootloader. And then uh, going from the uh, BTX client or boot two, this is the display that you uh, that you obtain. Again, we'll uh, we'll attempt to um, demonstrate that in in a bit. Alrighty, so the final step before the operating system is loaded is the uh, bootloader. And uh, uh, the bootloader is, uh, I like to think of it as a, uh, a sandbox uh, interpreter. Um, it has a uh, built-in command that you understand that you can give to uh, have it act in a specific way. Um, there are two main configuration files that control its behavior, uh, which are located under the, uh, the boot uh, directory. So loader.conf, and this is really the, the default that comes out of the, uh, the source tree. Uh, so it's not advised to actually touch that. Um, but the, again, the bootloader is a maintenance tool. If you want to see it like that, you can do uh, many maintenance tasks uh, from there. And in our specific case, we actually wanted to uh, improve it, improve it a bit better to have it uh, uh, acquire specific meaning depending on, on, on what you're doing. So this, this is some of the uh, features that the, uh, the, boot loader, the bootloader has. And uh, uh, again, the reason why we are able to have these many features, uh, these many complex features is based on the uh, historical context that I just covered. And we'll see later on that um, another reason is also the language and uh, some of the technologies that are used to implement the, uh, the loader. So the capabilities of the loader, what, what uh, can the interpreter do? Uh, as I was saying, it's a, uh, it's a maintenance tool. Uh, FreeBSD uh, source tree actually implements the bootloader uh, using two different languages. The legacy, the legacy one, um, or if I may say the old one, uh, which is called Fort, is uh, written using a language called FICL. Um, Hopefully I'm saying it right. <laughs> uh, but then there is the uh, next generation uh, bootloader, which is the default that comes uh, with any uh, standard installation. That bootloader is a superset of the old one because it actually uh, understands the commands that the legacy loader understands, but it also adds other, other functionalities. And that's due to the language used to uh, implement it, uh, Lua which is depending on uh, how you want to see it, a scripting or programming language uh, because it can be compiled. But uh, most of the scripts that control the display are actually written in, in, in Lua. And um, some of those scripts, the, actually the interpreter uh, itself is written in, in, in C and Lua actually permits uh, the interoperability between C and, and the scripting language, which make, makes it uh, a powerful technology. 
Alrighty, so how is the loader related to thermal capabilities and, and curses? So uh, under the hood, uh, the display, uh, the beautiful display that you see is controlled by a few scripts that actually leverage and curses that leverages terminal capabilities and uh, terminal escape sequences. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to clarify all of these terms uh, if it is still not clear. Uh, but this is the relationship between the bootloader display, uh, the terminal capabilities, and and curses, which is a uh, a library. Alrighty, so terminal capabilities. Uh, what exactly are terminal capabilities? I should say a technical term used to uh, define the capabilities. To repeat myself of your terminal, but uh, the term can be traced back to teletypes, where uh, control characters were actually sent to the teletype to have it let's say move a mechanical port like control return and uh, carriage return and, and the like. Uh, today, the specification goes beyond that. Uh, it touches on different aspects like the screen, uh, the, the mouse and the ability to play around with colors. And that's how all of this display uh, actually is done. And that's about uh, terminal capabilities. Now, are our terminal capabilities related to uh, escape sequences? So escape sequences are a terminal capability. Uh, it's part of the specification. Uh, escape sequences are really strings uh, set in a specific way with control characters within, within, within them um, that actually uh, have the, uh, the um, machine act in a specific way. So you may add a uh, escape sequence to let's say display color, for example, have the screen, uh, uh, the, the cursor blink and things of the like. So that's the relationship between terminal capabilities and uh, escape sequences. And um, now what exactly is n curses? n curses actually puts all of these together because it actually leverages uh, uh, escape sequences, which is again, a terminal capability. And it's a library written in uh, many languages, uh, namely in C, for example, but um, I'm aware of other languages that, uh, that implements the, this library as well. Alrighty, so with all of this information, how can you uh, go about extending the bootloader? Uh, first of all, the main entry point, if I may say so, uh, is the stand directory, which uh, is right under the uh, the source tree. It's one of the uh, uh, the main directories that stand right under the source tree um, if you are a developer. And within that directory, you have uh, subdirectories that are quite important that contain code or information that you that may, that may be relevant to you. You have the common subdirectory uh, underneath the stand directory that contains that's coming to both interpreter. Then you have the FICL directory contains uh, code for the uh, FICL uh, language. And then you have the fourth interpreter itself. You have uh, the Lua library uh, that actually is being used by uh, the interpreter, the interpreter written in Lua now. Um, and then you have other directories that may be relevant. Uh, to the work that you, you may be doing, like the main directory that pertains to the documentation and uh, the Lua that contains uh, the interpreter written in Lua. Alrighty, and it's also important to uh, understand the different scripts that are involved. And these are the main ones. Um, you may want to focus on CLI, which is which contains uh, most of the commands that uh, you can pass to the to interpreter, but um, the drawer as well, is um, the script that actually draws the screen and displays the different brands and the logos in, in the specific places. Uh, the menu has the menu being displayed, let's say uh, the menu that you see one through seven, that gives the different menus controlled by these. So this is the, uh, uh, in a very uh, quick way, the set of scripts, Lua scripts that control the uh, next generation interpreter. And um, from the environment stand 
uh, standpoint, these are the environment variables that you may want to use if you don't want to go as far as modifying uh, the scripts. You may control the coordinates, the brand. Uh, you may coordinate. You may control the coordinates of the brand and the logo, um, the Y and X coordinate, um, both at a time or depending on what you're doing uh, one at a time. Um, you also have, uh, let's say, the uh, the frame, for example, the main frame that also gives you an option on uh, the, the, the different types of frame that you can use. So all of these variables may be important to you if you are, let's say, uh, working on a distribution based on, on, on BSD, because this is one of the easiest way to actually have a distribution done uh, because you know the remaining code can be uh, changed along the way. But as soon as the display shows uh, a, a different company or a different entity, uh, people automatically see you as that entity. So again, this may be important um, to you depending on what you're doing. Alrighty, so now we are getting to the theming system that uh, uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, in our specific case, as I was saying, we needed a way to, an easy way to colorize and uh, display logos in a way to represent environments. Um, let's say for machines that uh, are used for production, for example, you would probably want a specific color to be displayed so that administrators know uh, as soon as the machine start, um, what, what kind of machine they are, they're working on. Um, so to make that happen, um, we have three different uh, bootloader variables that were introduced, and these control the three different areas of the display, which are the the logo, the brand, and the menu. Again, um, if these terms are not uh, too clear, I will get to the demonstration, and uh, it will it'll make uh, more sense. So these variable control independently uh, these these sections in a way to allow you to color code the display and then assign, let's say, specific meanings to that color code. And um, in doing so, we actually notice a, an indirect or maybe still, because we're still uh, working on the research, direct relationship between the, uh, the four color theorem in mathematics that states that uh, no more than four colors are needed to uh, colorize maps in such a way that uh, uh, two adjacent, uh, adjacent regions uh, may not have the same color. Um, this definition may be a little strict for, the, for our purpose because at times we do want uh, adjacent uh, areas to have specific colors. So let's say if you had a red menu, a red brand and a, a, uh, a, a red uh, a logo, these area will be adjacent. So the definition there will be a little too strict on that. But uh, for our purposes, this uh, constitute a uh, pretty a pretty good uh, foundational work to actually do our research on. So again, I'll get to the demonstration and uh, all of this will, will be clear. Um, so all of the uh, display obviously pertains to the bootloader uh, when the system starts. Uh, we are actually doing more work, more research to implement uh, some of these concepts when the system actually starts. Because once you have these variable sets, uh, depending on what you're doing, they may represent values uh, that you may use to, let's say, name a node, for example, on a network. You may want a, a, a uh, let's say, a production server to be named red, red, red. Uh, <laughs> just to make sure that uh, people not know that it's danger. Uh, but this is the kind of research that we are kind of doing uh, uh, after the bootloader uh, has loaded the system to see the application that may uh, we may fall on once this, uh, the system has started. So far, we have good news. Um, as of now, what we can do is actually at the very least have the prompt match the, the theme. So you may have a machine that starts, let's say, with all red display and then have the prompt match that as well so that, you know, you follow through uh, the theming concept. So this is the taking the theming concept uh, to the next level. Now, so what are the different benefits and uh, uh, why would you even want to implement that? Uh, now, specific case, uh, I believe, Good utilization of the terminal capabilities is one, 
we strive to use, I guess, uh, as much as we can, uh, the capabilities of uh, the terminal by allowing you to have colorful displays. And then, you know, it goes beyond that because if you want to strictly apply the, the concept related to the mathematical theorem that I just applied, you can also assign meanings to those uh, color codes, depending on, on what you're doing. Obviously, there's flexibility in the color code. Uh, we have three different sections. Uh, in our case, we have eight colors that we can play around with. So still working on uh, figuring out the uh, uh, combinatorics uh, equation beyond that, but there's a pretty uh, good number of uh, combination that you can have out of that uh, uh, color coding system. And then from vendors uh, like us or distribution based on FreeBSD like us, uh, this is foundational work that we wish we had when we started because it would, would have made uh, our work much better, but you know, uh, you do not necessarily need to wait uh, if you uh, if you if you have the skill to implement that. So the FreeBSD source code is actually a laboratory uh, for the power user. Uh, there's much code there and much information that can be leveraged to do a lot of stuff. Uh, this steaming uh, system is uh, one example. And um, the next uh, good, the next benefit, if I may say, will probably be environment separation, representation and identification. Um, in our specific case, we are currently collaborating with uh, an educational institution back in Africa, in Burkina Faso. Uh, and the requirement was to uh, make it possible to differentiate departments, uh, uh, divisions at a glance because they, they, we have the responsibility to actually help them uh, equip the computer lab uh, that um, students will have access to. And they, they will like the computer lab, for example, to have a specific color that will let students know that, you know, this is the, the system that they can they can play around with. So this is how all, uh, it all started. And we are quite happy with the result because we are kind of able to do just what we, uh, we wanted to do. And um, the last one will probably be easy production of distribution because the way the code has been written as of now, um, um, it automates a lot of the stuff. You can just plug and play. Um, you can probably just produce your logo using, um, let's say, your own method of producing ASCII characters, uh, logos using ASCII characters. And then once you have that, you can just plug in into the library and have that concept automatic, automatically be applied to, 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 that, to that logo with no change whatsoever. So that would be uh, the last good uh, uh, benefit there. So now I want to go into a demonstration and kind of uh, demonstrate those two, three different sections that I was uh, 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 talking about. So the brand, the logo, and the menu. Um, as you can see here, all of those sections I now have uh, the same color. And as mentioned uh, before, the mathematical uh, theorem in that specific case will be too strict because this will still be a combination that will still have a, let's say, a meaning. All right, so for the purpose, um, I actually installed VirtualBox and um, I will just go over to starting the machine. All right, so if we hit, there you go. Uh, stopping, as I was saying, the bootloader at the right time drops you into this kind of prompt. Right now we are actually standing uh, on boot tools prompt. And at this level, there's not really much you can do. You can go from there to the bootloader, but uh, you can also see, uh, let's say what you have there, what the machine has been able to recognize, but that's really about it But because the, code that backs it up is really rudimentary. Um, and then there you can, as I was saying, manage to go to the loader. And this is where we, uh, the concept actually comes into life. So in that specific case, for example, we have uh, a color coding of red, red, red. Um, I would assume that a, an entity that uses this will probably want to, let's say, use it as a uh, production because most of the time, Red means danger, uh, but let's say if you wanted to, um, and this 
concept actually applies to a lot more than uh, just a simple logo like that because you can also draw, let's say, country map and then exactly draw uh, a country map and then have those servers be represented as soon as the boot uh, by these map, um, country flags, I'm sorry, uh, by these country flags to kind of like help you, uh, remind you where these servers are and what uh, the purpose of, of these servers. So, so as I was saying, uh, so for first attempts, I'll try to randomly change the colors of the, those section and these three variable uh, that I was mentioning before so are so lower the brand theme. So let's set, uh, let's probably use green. Okay. And um, we use this guy. Um, logo. So. Team to let's say blue. Okay. So this is a first example of a color coding that you may assign to a specific machine to have a represent a specific environment. You may have the meaning of that uh, specific machine. Uh, in this case, green, red, and blue. Um, and as I was saying, if you pay attention, you can also see that uh, these variables are also set uh, as bootloaders variables, and uh, they may actually be used within the operating system when it boots. And this is how we are actually able to also figure out the, the theme that was set previously, uh, so we can also set the, the prompt once the, the machine also boots. Uh, so for a second attempt, uh, let's see, set loader, logo equal theme equals two, uh, see on this time, probably set in your theme to let's say my yellow, maybe. And again, this is uh, another combination that you may have. And uh, as a last example, uh, because I do not want to uh, waste, much, uh, waste much time, I believe the, the point was already made. I'll try to set the last example by maybe set loader and theme to, I'm not sure if anyone has a favorite color, <laughs> um, but I can probably, uh, maybe say no color instead. Uh, that's also an option that you have. And uh, set loader in your team two. This time I'll go with uh, magenta probably. And set logo theme to, uh, I would say, why not yellow? Already, again, this is the third example of uh, uh, the color, color coding system that uh, I just uh, spoke about. Uh, so I'll just return to the slide now and then uh, finish up with the uh, closing statement. Uh, and if there are any questions, I'll probably uh, just take them. All right, so again, uh, about us, we, we are a, a um, user group of FreeBSD, mainly located in uh, um, Africa, West Africa, and in East Africa. This is where most of the developers are. Uh, we are currently working on um, deploying the first uh, release of the Smartix OS project that we're currently working on. And the uh, institution that we are currently collaborating is part of that release. And um, as I was saying, um, part of the requirement was to uh, help equip this school, which is called uh, it called Saint Philomen. Uh, we have the responsibility to equip the uh, the uh, computer lab and some of those, the some of the classes that uh, they will they will be uh, using laptops and other hardware. So again, um, thanks for your attention. Uh, this was the uh, the requirement that we had and uh, the purpose of the work that we have done so far. So thanks again for your interest. I hope uh, this was 
interested, interesting enough. Not sure if um, you guys have questions that uh, may answer, but um, this is pretty much the, the end of the presentation. Not sure, yes. Most of the hardware you're using, is it uh, old enough that it doesn't support UEFI? It does. Um, I actually did not mention that, but uh, part of the research that we are doing extends this concept to actually PNGs. Because in the code, uh, depending on how you boot, when you boot using UEFI, instead of uh, ASCII characters being displayed, it's a PNG. Now, the goal or the challenge would be to figure out a way to display PNGs with a uh, transparent background to allow these uh, images to be uh, manipulated. But there, there are a few options that we are looking at, including manipulating the uh, color palette and all of that. But um, that's going to be complicated. <laughs> but there are different ways. We have different options. <laughs> But uh, I'm not sure if it answers your question. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it, it does answer your question, but there, there is possibility to uh, uh, apply that to UFI as well. <laughs> In particular, I was wondering, you know, if it made sense to continue to focus on the legacy bootloader since it's so limited compared to the EFI bootloader. Well, um, we are not aware of um, how many people are still using uh, legacy hardware and specifically because we are talking about Africa, you can expect a lot of people to be using uh, legacy hardware because of the cost that, that's involved in new hardware. So that may still be important depending on uh, uh, on the region that uh, you're in. So we'll support both, if I may say. So um, until we find uh, that it's, it's no longer needed to Any other question? Yeah, so so you mentioned that theming can go into like the prompt, like the actual CLI mm -hmm. after things have actually booted, et cetera. So are, are the students like using it like on the CLI or is this carry through into the into like a desktop environment as well? Um so that's a and I, that's a pretty good question because um yes, we are actually looking to carry it into the desktop environment, but uh because uh, some of the our hardware will be installed in the computer lab. Um, we would expect computer uh, science students to gain access to these laptops, and they may probably want to use the prompts on top of the desktop. So, you know, uh, we want to support both the prompt and uh, the desktop environment. No? Other questions? Well, uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, thank you very much for being here. It was really uh, an honor to uh, be able to present this material. Um, you guys may uh, probably expect a lot more work to be coming from us, but as of now, uh, this is what we have and uh, hopefully we'll get to you know uh, collaborate with a lot more engineers that see this uh, as a, uh, a potential. Alrighty. Thank you very much. <laughs>